Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are today. My name is Michelle Massey and I'm the director of public programs here at the Museum of Russian Art. As you can see, Masha and I are both situated in the gallery right now. And we are very excited to present our third in a series of three. So this is the last one a virtual tour with our curator. Dr. Masha Zavialova of this main exhibition, Leaders and the Masses, Mega Paintings from Soviet Ukraine. Now we do have all of these uh, virtual tours recorded and I will be sending the link in the chat box where you'll find a lot of information today. Uh, so that if you have not seen any of our previous programs uh, that are virtual, there's a place where we keep all of them on our website. And this program will also be uh, listed there as well. Uh, after today. So a couple other notes. Right now is uh, giving season for Give to the Max Day. Give to the Max Day is actually tomorrow, but you can start donating right now if you'd like. I'm going to post that link in the chat box at some point during our program. Uh, the exciting thing, there's a lot of wonderful nonprofits to give to and, and we'd appreciate being considered in your year-end giving. We do have a matching gift opportunity, so all donations up to $15,000 will be matched. So you can double your impact if you are thinking about donating. You can also uh, become a member of the museum. Uh, you get free admission to all exhibitions. And we're proud to say that even in these um, uncertain times, even with uh, COVID going on, this is a very safe to place to be. So um, we'd love to have you, but we're also happy to give you virtual programming if you um, are not local or if you are staying at home. So either way, we hope that you're safe. Uh, so with that, I am going to introduce you to our curator if you've not met her before. So our curator, Masha, was born in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, she received her doctorate from the University of Minnesota. And as our chief curator and head of exhibitions and collections, she has curated more than 50 exhibitions at the museum. She also works on independent curatorial projects and writes for art catalogs. And she's an award-winning translator of African-American women writing into Russian. She's also a co-director of the folk performance group, Mitka, and a board member of the American Siberian Educational Foundation. And so with that, I introduce you to our curator, Dr. Masha Zavialova. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for this wonderful introduction. I learned a lot about myself. And uh, I greet everyone who is with us here on Zoom to our museum today. Uh, let me start sharing my screen and we will go into our gallery. And I hope you can see my screen now. And today we continue with our virtual tour of our current exhibition, Leaders and the Masses. And today, as I promised last time, we will talk about um, some paintings that we have not covered in our previous exhibitions. So, and we will focus on women in uh, Soviet art and specifically in this exhibition. Um, and uh, we did not talk about women port portraits or portrayals of women when we were in the main gallery downstairs where the first part of our exhibition is concentrated, leaders. So we will go to the second floor, the masses. And there is a reason to this. Uh, even though the Soviet Union was radically feminist, especially, well, in the first uh, decade of its existence, the higher in the echelons of power you moved, the fewer women you would meet. So there were no women uh, among the leaders. Uh, and none in our exhibition. So, and, uh, you know, some statistics always help, even though all of these paintings are heavily ideological, but they are connected to uh, the social life of the country and to demographics even. They reflect uh, the uh, social situation in the country. And uh, even though, women were 
very well represented uh, in the Soviet times, in the medical profession, in education. There were about 49% of store managers and heads of trading organizations in the mid-level managerial class. Uh, they were underrepresented or absent in the highest echelons of power. In 1966, the Central Committee of the Communist Party numbered 195 members. Only four of them were women. Out of the 11 member Politburo, that's the highest Communist Party organ, and eight candidates to the Politburo, none were women. Now we know why we didn't talk about women uh, when we were downstairs in the main gallery. And uh, here we are in the mezzanine level and you see, actually you see this painting behind me. Uh, this is Stepan Repin's road construction. Uh, the Soviet art, Soviet art uh, very actively promoted images of women as active participants of uh, the socialist construction of the socialist society. And few of us actually realize how radically feminist the early Soviet state was and how it changed into a more conservative state and then changed back into a somewhat radical feminist state. So let me give you some background before we can start to unpack and learn to read these images of um, these portrayals of uh, Soviet women. So already in 1918, right after the revolution, the new Soviet constitution and family code um, granted full voting rights and full unrestricted access to education and full-time employment uh, for outside home for women. Uh, women uh, also received uh, rights to divorce and initiate a divorce and some other rights. I will mention them later. And this came from this very radical feminist position of some of the Soviet leaders, including Lenin, by the way. Uh, so Lenin wrote, I will give you a couple quotes because quotes are always helpful. They take us back to that historical moment and they're like a time machine for us. So Lenin wrote, described the drudgery of homework, housework once as, and this is the quote, as barbaric, unproductive, petty, nerve wracking, stupefying and depressing. That's how Lenin treated the uh, role of woman as a homemaker. And in 1919, Lenin's close associate and allegedly his lover, even though that was not uh, historically proven as a fact. Uh, and the prominent party member Inessa Arman advocated replacing millions of tiny households with clean and shining communal kitchens, communal canteens, and communal laundries. But uh, even more prominent and radical was uh, Alexandra Kolontai, who was at one point uh, uh, very highly a very highly positioned uh, party member and head of the Genodel, the women's department uh, within the Communist Party. And that's what she wrote in the early 20s. Uh, in place of the, and probably late 10s, in place of the indissoluble marriage based on the servitude of women, we shall see the rise of the free union of two members of the workers' state, equal in their rights and in their obligations. In place of the self-centered nuclear family, there will, be, there will arise a great universal family of workers. And the Soviet Union, uh, some of the uh, party members and members of the government actually debated the abolition of family altogether in the 1920s, just uh, abolishing it, the family as a social institution. 
and also the promise of this paradise of equal people no matter their gender was never realized by the 1950s the soviet union boasted the world's world's highest percentage of women in the national workforce so some of the goals were accomplished at least pushing women out of the house to work that was done and this revolution of uh, these um, changing roles in the society uh, resulted in Soviet art promoting women as workers, as active participants in the construction of the socialist society. In Soviet art, women were seldom portrayed as objects of beauty. And neither was a stereotyped as angels of the house or damsels in distress, and they were never demonized as seductresses. And we are talking about official Soviet art, of course. And uh, here we have, let's look at some paintings now, and I will give you some more uh, background in um, some social facts, facts about uh, the social life back in the Soviet Union, how it, at least how it impacted lives of women. So Stepan Repin Road Construction, 1959-1960, uh, uh, 1960. It's a large painting. You can see it behind me. It's on the mezzanine level. It is full of light and uh, uh, bright colors, uh, something that few people associate with uh, Soviet art. And here you can see the central figure of a woman. Uh, she's a road worker. You can see on the screen that this painting has two titles, and this is one of the uh, things that happens to cultural objects, including artworks, when they travel across borders. Uh, different kinds of translation happen, different, the paintings uh, enter different databases and checklists, and sometimes they uh, get different titles. So when we received this painting and I looked on the back of the painting, uh, it, it was written in Russian, New Road, not road construction. And this is a meaningful uh, difference because um, as you probably know by now, Soviet paintings always uh, had um, some kind of an ideological generalizing message. They acted on two levels. They were realist paintings, but they were also in a way futurist paintings, uh, paintings that reflected the uh, surroundings as they are, as they should be, as they hopefully will be. So there were many temporal levels in these paintings and also the kind of a metaphysical messaging uh, going on here. So road construction is just a fact. New road is something different. It's a new road to a new life. And look at this road, how it goes into this beautiful blue horizons. And um, quite often uh, this, um, the trajectory that the Soviet Union followed from the past into the future, into the presumably um, egalitarian communist society was metaphorized or compared to new roads to a new life. So it's not just uh, a road construction, it's building the society that's radically different from all the surrounding countries and leads uh, into that, uh, the blue, beautiful, remote, distant uh, future. Um, and uh, here you can see women work with shovels. But an interesting detail that you can see in many Soviet paintings, a man would be a driver. So he would be technologically savvy compared to just women workers who are strong and they uh, they can shovel gravel and sand and build roads, but probably could not quite 
be trusted with machinery. I don't know why. There are other paintings of women tractor drivers when artists make a point of showing um, that women are capable of many different things. But in this painting we see, as in some other paintings I saw, quite often the uh, um, person who handles the machinery would be male. But uh, it's, not a, it's not like a rule. It's not what always happened in Soviet paintings. And uh, let's look at some other paintings. Uh, here, I, am, uh, I would like to show you some of the installation shots, gallery shots, to show you where these paintings are and how beautifully they fit into our museum space. You know, it's an old church, but uh, these, the architecture is uh, varied and uh, there are arches, there are niches, there are two levels. And uh, so there are all kinds of these architectural, there are recesses and alcoves. Uh, there are uh, these architectural um, nooks and corners that are, even though they, you know that you are in a church, they are so perfectly uh, suited to show art. And this is our painting. So you see it in the gallery in that beautiful little corner on the mezzanine level next to the museum store that you should never miss, never miss our museum store. It's like a little museum, small museum in itself of contemporary folk art and some other kinds of art. And here is the painting by Shinkarenko, Bread, 1977. And Soviet paintings of women, women workers, and uh, in official art, they were mostly women workers um, as far as the representations of women would, would be concerned. Uh, we see a, a shop assistant, she's selling bread, but she also, she's like almost like the goddess of the harvest. Look at the abundance behind her and uh, the, a heap of uh, corn or a heap of uh, wheat behind her. Because usually, normally in a, in a bakery, you would not see that. So the artist put this, the plants behind her on purpose to sort of add to this overall feeling of the woman commanding the space, not just the selling the bread, but in a way, supervising the process from the seed, from the, the a seed of wheat when it grows into these beautiful plants and then is uh, harvested and made into bread through the work of many, many people. So uh, the plants are here to remind us that this bread is the work of many people. It's a uh, uh, the result of hard work of a collective of people, farmers and bakers and drivers and um, shop assistants, so all, all, all kinds of people. But also in a weird way, it creates this, um, for me at least, this uh, ambient atmosphere of uh, masterful woman who commands these different kinds of spheres, this, the universe of uh, growing and planting and growing harvest and harvesting and making bread, which was so very, and still is so very important in the Russian cuisine. And more farmers. And here uh, probably, uh, I don't know, because it's, uh, these are paintings from Soviet Ukraine. Uh, we see uh, women in our large paintings that portray industrial workers, but we have quite a lot of farmers here. And Ukraine that boasts of some of the richest soil on earth was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. So farming was really a huge part of Ukraine's economy uh, back in the days. And here we see 
Bead Farmers, a painting from 1967 uh, by Van Yevchenko. And these are sugar beads. They're not just regular red beads or gold beads. These are sugar beads. Ukraine was the probably the sole biggest producer of sugar beads and sugar for the Soviet Union. I still remember buying sugar in a Soviet uh, grocery store and it would, you know, come from Ukraine. And we bought uh, just sugar uh, as loose sugar and sugar cubes were quite popular. And those sugar cubes uh, were, would most likely, I still remember those boxes would come from Ukraine. So you see these um, women, very strong women uh, here, very productive and quite happy and proud of what they are doing here, uh, just um, growing beads for the whole of the over 200 million people of the Soviet Union. Uh, quite a socialist realist uh, type of the representation of women in Soviet art. And when I talk about uh, these paintings, remember I'm trying to explain what socialist realism are. I'm not talking what it was in real life or what it, how these paintings reflected the society. No, these paintings are socialist realists. They are programmatic. There is a program behind that, behind them. And uh, as far as uh, representations of women are, are concerned, there is a program for that too. So socialist realist, official Soviet art, uh, had uh, was programmatic in all and many aspects of, of its being, and including representations of women. But now we will look at this painting. It's quite unique in our collection, quite unique. And frankly, while it can be treated as socialist realist, it comes from 1973, 1974, when Brezhnev, uh, Soviet leader Brezhnev was in full power. And uh, he was, uh, I remember 1973, three, quite well. At that point, it seemed that the Soviet Union would never end, never ever. And in around 1973, actually, or 74, I had my clash with the KGB for reading Solzhenitsyn, for just reading a book and uh, talking to my friends about it because it was in English, so I had, I was charged with being a leader of a circle, of an anti-Soviet circle of uh, reading anti-Soviet literature. And after that, I remember how I thought, well, now with this bad record, and I was interrogated in the main Bolshoi Dom in the big building of the KGB headquarters in Leningrad, I thought, hmm, now I am never going to leave this country. They will never ever let me out. And I will never see my favorite countries of France. And I will never go to London. I will never visit the great plains of the United States that I read about so much in Fenimo Cooper, who was, and Brad Gard, those American writers that I loved. And um, this is when this painting was painted, exactly that, that those three years, 1973, 1976. And for that time, which seemed to be so stable, so Soviet, so stagnating in a way, because that's what this Brezhnev period is called uh, when they tried to divide the Soviet history into periods. Sometimes they call the Brezhnev leadership uh, the stagnation, the stagnation period of the Soviet Union, 1970s. Um, and um, that's why I look at this painting and it seems like it's so unusual for that period, which was still 
very, very solid. And I will explain why. Look at these two paintings now next to each other. On your right, you can see a Russian icon from the 18th century, from the Yaroslav School of Painting. Uh, uh, and this is the Saint, uh, Saint Thomaid, Thomaid uh, who was a patron saint of drunks who wanted to stop drinking. Uh, she was believed to help those who had that addiction and generally addictions. And you see it's the central figure standing in the center. She has a scroll, uh, some writing in her hand and um, the red cross in her right hand means that she was martyred. She was brutally killed by the anti-Christian forces in, uh, I think she lived in Byzantium. There is a long story of her life story uh, at the bottom of the icon. And you see scenes from her life all around her. So now look at the Soviet painting, and this is the uh, twice hero of the socialist labor. Let's look at the, yeah, portrait of twice hero of socialist labor, or, or Olga mostly, or Oksana Diptan but I don't know her first name, so don't quote me on that. Uh, so, twice hero of socialist labor, Comrade Diptan. Uh, this is her name. So you see her standing upright, also with some kind of a text or some kind of a notebook in her right hand. And all around her, we see these scenes from her life. So this painting does not just remind us, it's uh, quite intentionally modeled on those Russian icons. Or oh, they were Ukrainian icons, because Ukraine was also an Orthodox uh, country as far as the Denomination, church denomination for most of its population was, except for Western Ukraine, Catholics, and there were a, a vast majority of the Jewish population, uh, also a different religious denomination. So I'm not saying that the Orthodox were the only people who lived in Ukraine, but a significant portion of Ukrainians were, at least before the revolution, before all of them became Soviet and atheist. Well, not all of them. Some of them remain secretly religious, and some of them even went to churches. And uh, so these artists and the people who looked at this painting in the 1970s would get this reference right away. Uh, that it's not just uh, a way the artist treats his theme and the way he wants to represent it. No, it's a direct, clear, and open reference to a Russian icon. And here we see the creation of a new saint, saint a socialist saint in a way. But it's the only painting where it was done in such a direct way with this direct reference to Russian icons. And it, I think it balanced back then, and in my mind, it balances on the edge of socialist realist style. Uh, it's not even quite socialist realist because it's not realist, right? And icons are distinguished by the uh, the way they treat time. And time in icons is usually simultaneous. So you are in the past, you are in the present, and in the future at the same time. All of these life scenes depict the story of uh, the saint's life, same as here. In this painting, you see uh, the story of uh, this twice hero of socialist labor, Comrade Diptan, um, just developing uh, through 
these different events and locations that her life is connected to. Uh, you can see her walking in the field. You can see her family. This is most likely her husband. You can see her house. On top, you will you see uh, the village that she is from. It's the central, the center, the downtown, you can say, of the collective farm that she uh, belongs to, that where she lives. And you can see a statue of either Lenin or probably a local hero uh, from the Soviet era. So you can see it here. And then here you can see two women kissing. And it's most likely it's the moment when our comrade Diptan was awarded one of her gold stars of the hero of socialist labor. That was the highest award that would be given to um, citizens of the Soviet Union for peaceful labor. And she had two of those. That was indeed extraordinary. And we see some other medals here on her right shoulder. But having uh, uh, two orders, uh, medals of the order of the hero of socialist, gold, two gold stars of the hero of socialist labor was quite rare. And that's why the artist chose to paint her as a real saint. I don't know what uh, is more prominent in this painting. This kind of naive approach uh, to the tenets and dogmas of socialist realist style saying, yeah, in the past, uh, those people had icons before the revolution and they were icons of saints who were whose only uh, heroism and whose only greatness was in how they believed in God. Our saints are different. Our saints are really outstanding people. They have these highest awards and they work self selflessly for the uh, benefit of their country and they get awarded for that. So here is the bottom right, you can see uh, what uh, our hero of, twice hero of socialist labor does in life. And she grows sugar beets. So same as uh, we saw in our painting of beet farmers, just on, on the previous page of our presentation here. But also it could be this, you know, naive desire to overdo a socialist realist dogma to show that, yeah, we, uh, that's what uh, these uh, worker women are. They are true outstanding heroes and saint-like figures, but this is a different kind of sainthood, all uh, imminent to life to Soviet life. Or was he a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek, a little bit ironic about the whole situation? Because the painting is definitely painted in the naive style of an untrained village artist. Although this artist, uh, and we know from his background, was well-trained and he could paint those uh, highly realist and refined and academic painting, uh, paintings as well as other people. But he chose this style on the verge of being ironic, playing with these cultural codes of socialist, of socialist realist style. Um, so this is an altogether worthy painting. It's large. This painting, let's look at this size. It's 79 inches uh, high. So this woman is uh, either her height or she is larger than life actually. Worth looking at. Unfortunately, we don't have this icon on display anymore, but those people who remember our exhibition of Yaroslav icons would remember this. It was also on the mezzanine level, also a very large, icon. 
And another example of um, icons with life stories of saints. We also exhibited this icon. This is Mother of God of Vladimir uh, from Yaroslav uh, that actually we borrowed. We had a loan from the Yaroslav Art Museum and it also comes from the Yaroslav School of Icon Painting, 18th century uh, Yaroslav and the surrounding uh, region. And this is the Mother of God of Vladimir. And here you can see it's a beautiful, uh, beautifully painted icon. And you can see the story around, not of the Mother of God and uh, Child Christ, but of the icon. So here you can see on top uh, Apostle Luke, uh, allegedly an artist, paints uh, the uh, Virgin Mary with child. And uh, our icon or the original icon of Mother of God of Vladimir was believed to be painted by Apostle Luke, Saint Luke. And then he presents it to the Mother of God. Then uh, the icon moves from Byzantium to Russia, to Kiev, and then it uh, protects uh, wherever she is, she protects towns from in, the invasion. Then it moves to um, the town of Vladimir and then to Moscow. And now you can see this icon, not this icon, but the original icon of uh, Mother God of Vladimir in Moscow. So the whole story of that icon is painted in the scenes, uh, little stories on the margins, same as our uh, painting. And now I would like to show you some paintings that are not actually on display right now, but they come from the same collection. So a little bit of a behind the scenes glimpse into our museum collection and into the donation from Rose Brady, the donation that was uh, uh, given to us end of 2019. And some of the paintings, this painting actually arrived in uh, 2020, just a few months ago and uh, we have it in our storage now. Uh, and I want to again express my gratitude to our donor, Rose Brady. I hope she is listening to us uh, today. Uh, I hope she is with us uh, from Florida. And uh, I would like to show some of the paintings that are not included in this exhibition. We will show them eventually, but uh, there is no, scheduled exhibition to show these paintings yet. So you will have this uh, preview of this glimpse into behind the scenes collection of the Museum of Russian Art, our most recent uh, acquisition of paintings. And this is the Milkmaid, 1970. Uh, and it joins the company of other milkmaids that we have in our collection. And we have several of them, actually. Milkmaids, uh, as well as, um, you know, women farmers. Milkmaids were very popular subjects uh, for Soviet artists. I don't know why they chose uh, milkmaids versus um, sheep breeders or I don't know, even textile workers uh, that were prominent on the pages of the communist press were not so frequently portrayed as milkmaids, probably because of the, you know, picturesque white uh, coats they wear and cows and green grass and the nature around them and their healthy looks, of course, <laughs> because, you know, milkmaids uh, have to be or had to be in the Soviet times. Those farms were not very heavily equipped with all kinds of equipment. And these women had to milk cows with their hands and had to be outdoors a lot of time because the, you know, the barns, the barns where cows were kept were not heated. So they were always 
uh, in the fresh air, healthy looking with nice uh, suntan or nice rosy cheeks as our farmer, our milkmaid here. And again, sometimes you, uh, people say, yeah, these paintings uh, portray honest work and simple workers and they could be painted anywhere. But not quite. All of these paintings are programmatic and uh, there is a selective approach to how you paint milkmaids or beetroot farmers or welders or road construction women workers. There is, there is a certain program, there is a certain ideological agenda behind them always. And here we can say uh, that it's a milkmaid who is quite healthy and happy. But this would be a more stereotyped approach to Soviet art because it was not always that simple. Of course, these artists who chose to portray ordinary workers versus Lenin and Stalin and Brezhnev and Soviet leaders and uh, head of the Communist Party section of this specific village or town, uh, they were portraying simple folk workers, no matter uh, what the ideological impetus was behind this painting and they always uh, evoked a different kind of response from uh, from uh, viewers especially viewers from that area from that specific region who would be proud of having some of their uh, comrades, some of their friends, some of the relatives, people they know portrayed in the painting. Of course, if you lived in a big city like I did uh, back in Leningrad, I would look at this painting and would say, well, it's another happy milkmaid. That's what I would see in that painting. But um, that was because when I looked at socialist realist art back in the 70s, when I began to study art, and in the 80s, until the collapse of the Soviet Union, I looked at it differently. And the situation of this art in society was structurally different. At that time, it was part of the apparatus, of the ideological apparatus. And it had a somewhat repressive function. So it was uh, threatening in a way. And at that time, I, I didn't know how to analyze art or literature because of the way it was taught in Soviet schools. It was just, you were given the point of view to adopt and not to criticize. And later when I became more critical and I learned to read and unpack uh, to a certain extent because literature and art are so profoundly deep, it would be impossible for one person to unpack all the meanings and all of the uh, codes that are contained in every painting. Uh, so now I look at these paintings differently and partly because they lost the threatening um, power over me. The Soviet Union collapsed, so their function is over. Now at last we can look at this painting so for what they are and study them and learn from them and see the beauty of the art and see the ideological agenda behind it. Because this painting is beautifully painted. Sergei Svetlorusov was uh, quite a prominent artist I believe they have his art, uh, his paintings in two major museums in Russia, in the Tretikov Gallery and or the State Russian Museum. It's a very, very nicely painted painting. Uh, Ashat Safargarian use a different kind of approach to the painting. Uh, and uh, uh, this painting, is what I would call 
not quite part of that socialist realist canon of paintings and in the 70s there was a strong non-conformist movement and while this painting is not quite non-conformist it could be uh, exhibited in any official republican or national or uh, local exhibition back uh, in the Soviet times but at the same time the style is more experimental than those realist paintings that we saw before except except for the twice hero that's really a unique painting I've never seen anything like this uh, among official Soviet socialist realist works of art um, a youth so painted with a kind of a modernist approach uh, with the artist trying to look, uh, it's in a way a psychological portrait. It's not an ideological or a portrait of a worker. We don't know what she is uh, and what her occupation is. Although, no, we don't because uh, the artist took care of uh, removing all of the uh, attributes and accessories of your profession from the view. There is a vase here and first I thought this looked like brushes stuck into a vase but this could be like dry plants as well. well probably they are brushes but it's hard to say and uh, if they are brushes then she's an artist but all we know about her is th that she's a young person, a young female and um, just to show you the variety of representations of soviet women in the soviet union and now we are back to our working woman the beginning of construction and quite often uh, soviet artists chose to paint women doing just the hardest kind of work ever uh, uh, previously in our exhibition exhibitions we had uh, women portrayed as loggers i remember this wonderful painting by uh frolov i believe artist frolov of a woman logger balancing on logs in the midst of icy cold water because it seemed like it was um, early spring or I don't know late summer and handling logs in water standing on one of the oh, probably on two of the logs handling heavy logs with a long uh, hook so this woman uh, is probably a person who surveys land before construction so she has this measuring tool and uh, so possibly she's a land surveyor this painting also uh, belongs to probably what i would call close to the severe style the style of the uh, 1960s when soviet artists began to deviate from this uh, sweet and very optimistic portrayals of Soviet life and Soviet workers and began to create more of um, paintings that show the harsh realities of life of Soviet workers and chose a different style. Local colors, more drastic outlines, drastic lines, contrasts, more generalized approach to painting uh, the realistic details of uh, the surrounding reality for our characters and that's what we see in this painting but also i will show you just some different images uh, mother and child so motherhood of course was an important theme uh, especially after uh, the 19, mid 1930s when there was a drastic change in the family domestic policies um, that impacted families in the Soviet Union. 
So as you remember, uh, the 1920s were quite tragical in how the Soviet government began to liberate women and give them equal rights and full access to work and education. At that time, uh, abortion was free and available, uh, available on request. Divorce was made so easy. So church marriages were abolished. Divorce in the 1920s could be done by mail and the consent of the other spouse was not necessary. You just mail a postcard to the registration office and say that you are not, uh, you should be considered and registered as a divorced person and that would be accomplished. And all of a sudden, and these are these very interesting things that happened in Soviet politics, mid 1930s, there is an about turn 180 degrees or 360, no, 180 degrees back to reinforcing family values and Stalin begins to heavily promote um, uh, the importance of family and children probably connected to a drastic drop in childbirth at that time. And a huge numbers of homeless children from uh, roaming the streets in the late 1920s, not so much in mid 1930s. And uh, so the abortions get prohibited again. The divorce is made very difficult. At the same time, family holidays are encouraged, and that's why New Year is revived as a winter holiday. And uh, we didn't have winter holidays, in, especially in the late 1920s. So the Stalinist policies, conservative policies, back to strengthening family values. And after Stalin's death, uh, that was sort of reversed. Abortions were allowed. Divorce was made uh, not so difficult, but not so easy as in the 1920s. And uh, both uh, images of motherhood and images of strong women workers began to frequent canvases of Soviet artists. Let me show you some more of these paintings from behind the scenes. And I think it's time for us to uh, go into the Q&A uh, section of our presentation. More, these paintings are on display here in the museum. And I encourage you to come and look at these monumental paintings. Look at some of the sizes. No screen image would ever, ever uh, uh, just show you what these paintings are in reality. They are 118 inches long, some of them, and 114 another, and uh, they're really very, very unique in that respect. Michelle, so let's do hello. Uh, hello. <laughs> let's do our Q and A. Yes, and thank you to everyone who's been sending lots of questions and comments. And um, um, this is a very interesting discussion. And Masha, I love listening to you speak about the overarching um, period of, of socialist realism and Soviet times. Um, I think um, you set the scene really well for the different um, ways that the dogma, that the program, like the, that it was presented. But we did have a question if there was, um, if you could speak to it in a, a process um, that artists had to go through to be considered official art of the time. Was there anything they had to do? Were they certified as artists themselves? Can you speak to that? Uh, well, um, to become an official artist, you mean, you, you right. had to want it first. Uh, you had to get an education. So these were all professional artists. And then after uh, you received your education in one of the art institutes, but not necessarily. Sometimes there were these intermediate art schools. There were um, schools that taught folk art, like the art of phallic lacquer boxes. And then with that, 
having painted some uh, artworks that were quite looking professional, you would apply to become a member of the Soviet Artists Union. And that was the one organization that controlled and organized and coordinated the work and the functioning and the life of the Soviet art scene in a way. And then uh, becoming a member, you could have access to studio space, you had access to commissions through the art fund, which was affiliated with the Soviet Artist Union. And then, and you could be a member of the Soviet Artist Union as a book illustrator. You could do children's books and then you didn't have to uh, meddle with all of the socialist, realist, ideological um, rules and regulations. That was all a bit, you know, you had to have some kind of a desire to be published and exhibited at large exhibitions and also to believe in at least some of the goals of uh, the Soviet state, because you, as an artist, you would never be completely a liar and uh, like uh, ch just make socialist realist art to get more money. That I don't believe that ever happened. So you had to at least partially believe in some of the ideas behind the Soviet state. And then you would just submit your paintings to be considered for uh, big national and Republican exhibitions and just keep going. Thank you. Uh, how about, you know, of that union of these official um, artists, do you have any information on, I mean, we know that where there were women artists as well as men during this time as official artists. Do you have any um, idea or any statistics on, how many were women or were there a lot of them? Can you tell us more about that? Uh, no, there were, uh, whenever we have exhibitions from the 60s and 70s, no, we don't, there were not a lot of um, women artists at that time. And uh, we have some, uh, mm -hmm. So we have uh, Oksana Kirichenko. Yeah, housewarming is. Yeah, housewarming. And um, uh, uh, so we have just two or three uh, women artists here. But um, their art was not actually quite readily distinguishable from that of the male counterparts. Soviet women when artists were not encouraged to explore feminist agendas. So they basically, you would sometimes you would not even know if it was a woman or a, a male or a female artist. Uh, in late, the late 1930s, it was declared by the government that the um, women's liberation was achieved and that no more questions should be asked about that because the Soviet government made everything great for women. That's why in the 1980s, and I know that one of them is a friend of mine, when four feminists began to publish underground uh, women's magazine, they were prosecuted mm -hmm. by the KGB and exiled from the country. So feminist agenda was uh, considered done. So uh, if you raised questions about women's roles and women's life and society, it meant that you questioned the politics and policies of the Soviet state towards women as imperfect. And that was a crime. <laughs> Fascinating. That, that leads me to a really interesting question. Uh, I'm going to read it, actually, so I get, the entirety, get it in its entirety. Um, so this question says, Soviet women were elevated out of the family into the workforce, supposedly freeing them from the drudgery of family responsibilities. And this questioner was talking about a, a book that they read called Just Another Week. I can't read the Russian. Maybe you can read it. Um, uh, in which she, the author, poignantly relays how heroic Soviet women really were because they were never freed of their domestic duties. So can you speak to, you know, kind of that reality um, 
between sort of what the the idea, you know, what the idea was and what the reality was. Yeah, of course. Uh, it's just uh, when we look at these paintings, we look at the official version of a Soviet woman, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't have nonconformist paintings uh, or paintings by nonconformist women artists that question this. Um, the um, achievements of the Soviet state as far as uh, the family and women and childhood policies were concerned. And uh, yeah, under the dazzling reports uh, from the Soviet press, the realities of women's life, lives were first of all invisible and second of all stark. So uh, because the feminist, you could not discuss the you know the all the difficult aspects of women's lives they were they were just not discussed and debated and uh, so women were uh, as we know the soviet union had the largest percentage of women in the workforce i think 50s and 60s 90 percent or 95 percent of women worked but their roles as homemakers and mothers were still with them and men were not trained to share that mm -hmm. so and uh, you know the soviet uh everyday life was not made easy by the achievements of soviet light industry i remember we had a fridge but my mom never had uh, an automatic washing machine so you had to do it by hand then you would go to a store and there would be a long line to get some groceries or at least a line. And so there would be these lines and um, no, that was very, very, very difficult. And that story uh, that is mentioned in this question every a week like any other, it, show, it just goes through a woman's week literally almost hour by hour or like day by day to show that she works and then she comes back home and she works as much many many hours uh, after work yeah and that's what uh, this uh, soviet um, late soviet feminist magazine was about it began to you know, question those things and write about all of the problems that women's lives had. And that's why they were uh, expelled from the country. Oh, thank you so much, Masha. Well, I think we're coming down to our, our the end of our program. Um, before we go, this is once again, the third uh, presentation, a third a virtual tour of this particular exhibition out of three. So this is the final one in the series. We encourage you to take a look back uh, on our virtual programming um, uh, uh, tab on our website, and you can see all of these programs. This one will be posted tomorrow morning. So you'll be able to share this with your family and friends. Uh, Masha, before we go, any, um, further comments about this exhibition and maybe we should mention our holiday exhibition on view as well. Uh, yeah, so we just opened uh, our annual holiday exhibition from the collection of Kim Balashak and uh, Blaine Bolden also. And this year it's about masks. So every year we try to make it different and this year Everything is about masks, so our exhibition is. And we have a collection of Soviet era masks and the only time we, back in the Soviet Union, and actually in Russia probably, wore masks would be around New Year. There were New Year masquerades and carnivals and people still remember those costumes of bunnies and uh, foxes. So we have, it's a wonderful exhibition with stories behind the, some of these characters. And um, yeah, you should just come and enjoy I it. See. <laughs> I'm right here. I'm in the lower gallery right now, as you can see. Uh, I have posted a few different links onto the chat section. Um, 
you can find a lot of information on our website, of course. Again, if you feel like uh, including the Museum of Russian Art in your year-end giving, if you donate through GiveMN today through tomorrow, which is Give to the Max Day, uh, doubles your impact because we have a matching gift opportunity. The museum is open right now seven days a week, as is our uh, shop, our gift shop, which is amazing. Uh, we love having you. It's really nice um, to have people from all over the world come to these virtual tours. That is one advantage, one advantage to our virtual programming uh, needs right now. So we get to meet a lot more of you. If you're Michelle, able to come. Michelle, yeah. You know, I have, I see there is one last question I want to answer. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it's the painting bread. And someone asked about little plants yes. that lie mm -hmm. uh, on the counter and uh, saying that it's like you think of capitalism. Well, when I look at those coins, I think about uh, the price of bread and how inexpensive it was. So these coins are cents in a way. They're not, if you convert, they're not dollars, they're not dollar bills, they are cents. They're copics. And bread in the Soviet Union at that time cost uh, a large loaf of rye bread was 14 copics. And because it didn't change for like decades, when I talked to my friends, they would still remember those prices. We all remember those prices because they were universal across the 2 million uh, uh, popular country, uh, across the 11 time zones and uh, throughout many, many years. So 14 copics for a loaf of bread, rye, and the white bread would cost between 30, I remember 13, the most expensive was like 22 probably. So copics, which is like a large two pound or three pound loaf of bread, 14 cents. So that's actually these coins also show that she works as a shop assistant, she sells bread and the bread is not really all that expensive. These are socialist realist paintings after all. So we need to remember that. We need always to find a way to interpret them so that they are flattering to the Soviet regime. <laughs> That's a good way to sum it up. That's a good way to sum it up, Masha. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you for tuning in today. And again, this will be posted so that you can share this program and our other virtual programs with your family and friends. Please stay safe and uh, um, we wish you well and we hope that we will see some of you in the gallery sometime soon. Feel free to reach out via email if you have further questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you again, Masha. See you later, everybody. Thank you, all. Thank, you. thank you, Michelle, for uh, coordinating this, thanks. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, have a good day, everyone.